I told my mom I was coming to, uh, to Montgomery, yeah. Alabama, and I was going to go to what I told her was a lynching museum. And she said, why would they want to do that? <laughs> yeah. I think that we have developed uh, a, a really uh, advanced coping strategy of silence. This is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, a site dedicated to the more than 4,000 victims of lynching in America. You know, we started the research years ago, and then the monuments started to come. And when they arrived, I think the thing that completely blew me away that I hadn't just thought about before was sort of seeing these names. He is Brian Stevenson, a lawyer who founded the Equal Justice Initiative, or EJI, an organization with a long and powerful record of getting more than 100 people off of death row, of fighting for juveniles with life sentences, and of winning cases that went as high as the Supreme Court. Even in the names, you see stories like this is an entire family that's killed in, in Patnow County, Georgia. And those stories are everywhere. Elizabeth Lawrence lynched in Birmingham, 1933. School teacher coming home, she was walking and a bunch of white kids started throwing stones at her. Mm -hmm. And like any good teacher, she said to these kids, don't throw stones at people. They went home and told their parents that they had been chastised by a black woman. The parents were outraged. They organized a mob, they went to her home and they lynched her. The memorial and a nearby museum that connects slavery, lynching, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration open on April 26th. And some people might find it difficult to make the connection between slavery and mass incarceration it might be a difficult leap for mm -hmm. some people. Well, and I don't think people should leap. I think it's a continuum, right? This picture gives insight on why we're talking about this. Southern prisons made incarcerated people pick cotton until the 80s and early 1990s. And that's where that language in the state in the 13th Amendment that prohibits slavery except for people convicted of crimes becomes so relevant. This isn't an accident. Right. It's funny, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm starting to sound like the people who raised me. But I, I'm too old for it. I've seen too much. I don't want to go through another 30 years of seeing people wrongly convicted and brutalized and condemned and mistreated uh, and not do something disruptive, do something different. What is your hope uh, that people will take away from this museum once they spend time here going through the exhibits? I think we need to create spaces in this country where we tell the story of what happened to Native people, where we tell the story of what happened to African Americans, where we tell the story of slavery, the story of lynching, the story of segregation. And at the end of it, people are motivated to say, never again. Because I don't think we've ever been required to say that. So my hope is that people will leave this space uh, prepared to say, never again can we tolerate racial bias and bigotry anywhere. And I think if we create a consciousness like that, uh, we can begin to expect more from our institutions, from our schools, from our system, our court system, from our elected leaders than we expect right now. We don't expect as much as we should. As the year 2019 marks 400 years since the commencement of the transatlantic slave trade, Ghanaian artist Kwame Akoto Bamfo has been sculpting hundreds of faces to represent the men and women who fell victim to slavery. Akoto Bamfo has placed the sculptures in Adafoa, which was a major slave market in the 19th century when the region was under British rule. What I hope to do is to capture an experience and let this art uh, trigger a dialogue about who we are as an African people, who we were before and then where we are going, especially with uh, something like the transatlantic slave trade and the sub-Saharan slave trade and racism 
having happened as a result, you know, of this uh, atrocity. Akoto Bamfo said he used to choose his models in the past to portray specific expressions and traits. But now he prefers to use random models so as to sculpt faces from all over Africa because people from all over the continent were enslaved. Previously, I will pick a, a particular model based on the looks and then what I have in my head and then what I want to portray. But then um, over the years to cut down on the idealism that uh, in the work, in the narrative and then in the people being portrayed. The artist believes the best way to remember the ancestors is to respect their descendants. The best way to celebrate these 400 years is to look at what these people, to honor the dreams of these people that we've lost. And the dreams being that they were human beings, they had rights, and their descendants should continue to have rights and be considered part of the citizens of the world. The project that began in 2010 continues to grow and expand across continents. One of his pieces already stands in the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Alabama in the United States. Fourteen people, seven adults and seven children. We don't know their names. These facial reconstructions give us a clue as to what they may have looked like. The way they were buried was in very plain pine coffins. Experts like Lisa Anderson, curator of bioarchaeology at the State Museum, believe they were slaves who belonged to Albany's prominent Schuyler family in the 18th century. The adults, a uh, number of them were of African ancestry. The bones of the deceased slaves have primarily been housed at the museum since their discovery more than a decade ago. Anderson used the adult bones along with documents like census data, runaway slave posters, and even a memoir to paint a picture of their lives. All of them uh, worked fairly hard throughout their entire lives. So they, even the youngest woman, had signs of arthritis. Slavery is a system that can rear its ugly head if we don't really uh, have a dialogue. Evelyn King heads the Schuyler Flats Burial Ground Project. The group has organized a memorial in mid-June before the former slaves will be buried one last time at St. Agnes Cemetery. We had to right a wrong. Kelly Grimaldi is a historian at St. Agnes Cemetery and an organizer of the Slave Reburial Project. She says the slaves, in their death, brought an entire community of people of various ethnicities together. They drew an entire community together binding us together for a common purpose, and that is to bury them with dignity and respect. The respect that they didn't get when they were alive. The new sculpture is a collaboration by artist Michael Visocci and poet Lem Sisse. Significantly, it is sited in London's financial district, close to the site where the Reverend John Newton's powerful anti-slavery sermons inspired the abolitionist William Wilberforce. The inspiration is taken mainly from the, the, the shape of sugarcane and its sort of repeating form of these segments. So you see that in the columns here. But these columns also make reference to uh, sugar barrels and also African beadwork, which ties nicely into the, the abolition story. The work is a powerful combination of the use of sculpture, poetry, architecture and space. I mean, my main intent was to allow the sculpture to engage with the, with the flow of pedestrians and um, to, to allow people to walk amongst it and become part of it. This is really important to me. And also with the, the steps on the podium or the pulpit allows the viewer to actually engage and become part of the story for a short while. The sculpture includes the work of poet Lem Sisse and his poem entitled The Guilt of Cain. It mixes the language of the Stock Exchange trading floor with Old Testament biblical references. Cain gathers Cain as guilt gift to his land, but whose sword of truth shall not sleep in his land? Who shall unlock the stocks and share, break the bond, the bind, unbound, lay bare the truth?
The poet hopes this work of public art will raise awareness of the issue of slavery. I think the sculpture is incredible. The work that the sculptor Michael Versace has done is, is really own this square um, in the heart of the city of London. And to have my poem um, bursting from the sculptor um, inscripted inside it is a real honour uh, for me. The sculpture is part of an ongoing campaign to bring works of art to many of the squares in the city of London. We wandered by the home of Dr. Charles Smith in Hammond, Louisiana, and found ourselves going in for a closer look. This Vietnam veteran and part-time preacher has found his true calling in sculpture, and he's turned his front yard into an amazing open-air museum. I'm Dr. Charles Smith, the founder and the curator and the sole artist of the African American Heritage Museum and Black Veteran Archive. We tell the story in the pieces. As you can see, some are completely done, and some of those are just right now in the process of being completed. Those standing here with the American flag represents a memorial to those children that have died by crime, family violence, gangs, and drugs. The wall is a memorial to those that died in New Orleans in Katrina. The height of that wall lets you know how high the water was where the people perished in terms of the situation. This is what we call the 40 acres and a mule. He's waiting for the promise to the people of color in reconstruction. This piece here is the sister that was captured and brought out of Africa to the United States for sale on the plantation. This is how the female arrived. She was wrapped so that she would not be tampered with by the ship's crew. These are the things we explain to the young people why it's important to understand and know your history. This is a memorial to the 7,427 African Americans that died in Vietnam. This is a war that I participated in and this is a war that America seems to want to forget. This is their memorial, the only one in America. The crowd is not so thick back here. <laughs> Here's a permanent gardener. That's what his job from when the day he was born until the day he died, that's all he did was take care of the plant around the plantation. Faces that you see on the wall is a memorial to Maya Angelou, to those sisters that came from Africa on the slave ship, to her poem, they came to stay. This is the LGBT, so that we don't leave out anyone that has a story to tell on how we are, who we are, and what we are. Blondie, she has her shades. <laughs> this is a preparation piece for a client. He wanted something made with his son's camera who passed away. Believe it or not, 90% of the people that support and purchase this art is white. 9% is Hispanic and only 1% is African American. It's ignorance. I'm preparing my son to carry on my legacy. 